as well. Uh, do want to add my welcome. Very, very good to see all of you. I appreciate you, uh, uh, any of you that have come to be with us personally, numbers of you watching online as well, and I'm grateful for your interest. Thank God. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 16. I uh, started a series um, on the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew chapter 16 is a significant uh, chapter in the Bible because it is a shifting point of Jesus' ministry. And in this, Jesus reveals for the first time God's plan for the church. And so I'm preaching four messages on the foundations of the church. We looked firstly at God's, uh, the foundation of revelation which everything is uh, uh, in the kingdom of God is based on. We looked at the master plan, which is God's will for the church. And now we move into the supernatural power that God gives. And that's what we're going to look at tonight in Matthew chapter 16. By way of illustration, in Medford, Oregon, in the news, they, uh, a man tried to uh, steal a bike from outside a mall. The bike owner, several other people, tried chasing him on foot, but he was on the bike and they couldn't catch him. Rancher Robert Borba, who had a horse in his trailer in the mall parking lot, mounted his horse and gave chase and lassoed the thief around the ankles when he jumped off the bike. Borba said, I seen this fella trying to get up to speed on a bicycle. I don't know how he talked, but I'm just adding it in there anyway. <laughs> I wasn't going to catch him on foot. I just don't run very fast. I use a rope every day. That's how I make my living. I figured if it catches cattle pretty good, it'll catch a bandit pretty good. He said I was going to pull his legs off. I didn't think I'd pull his legs off, but I sure wasn't going to let him go. Kept him tied up until police arrived. And police arrested and charged a Seattle man with theft. We've never had anyone lassoed and held until we got there. That's a first for me, said Police Sergeant Darren May. So here's the point in this story is the will of the government is that there be justice. And so what this man did is he stepped in and played a part in bringing about justice. Now, that applies to the scripture that we're going to read. Jesus gives the understanding of God's purpose in the earth, which is the, the cross and the church. And he lets his disciples know there is going to be supernatural opposition. And then he tells, now we're at the portion in verse 18 and 19 here, when Jesus says, every believer can use God's power to overcome supernatural opposition. And the Bible calls this binding and loosing. And so we're going to look tonight at binding and loosing, Matthew 16, verse 18. Read with me. I say to you that you are Peter. On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Binding and loosing. Let's talk first of all about deputized believers. Jesus gives the understanding of resistance. He's just told them God's will is the church. God's will is Jesus revealed in the earth. And immediately he then tells of the fact of resistance, the gates of hell. In Old Testament times, gates were where leaders met. That was where strategies were formed for war. Judges 5.8 says there, were, there was war in the gates. Or literally at the gates is where they planned their strategies of battle. So Jesus says... If God has a will on the earth, there is organized uh, supernatural opposition. These are battle words that he's talking about. So, 
God plans certain things to happen in the earth. And he says, you better believe that the enemy will also makes plans to stop, hinder, or destroy God's plans. This is as old as human beings. Genesis chapter 3, I will make you, talking to the devil, you and the woman enemies to each other, your descendants and her descendants, will be enemies. The Bible goes on in 1 Thessalonians 2.18, I wanted to come to you again and again, but Satan hindered. So here there's something I wanted to do for God, but there was something standing in the way. And 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, the devil who rules this world has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. They cannot see the light of the good news the good news about the glory of Christ who is exactly like God. Here is, if you've ever been puzzled as you are witnessing to family or friends or workmates, it, it should be the easiest thing in the world. Hell is hot, you're going there, Jesus died so you don't have to, any questions. That shouldn't be hard. But you, you can tell people the goodness of God and how God can change their life. And the Bible says the problem is the enemy is opposing, in this case, blinding them so that it doesn't sink in or make sense. The Old Testament, the, the spies came back from the promised land. And the report that they gave, 10 of them, was there is walls or there are walls and giants. There are things standing in the way keeping us from what we should have. There are enemies that oppose what God wants us to have. And 1 Corinthians 16 9, for a great and effective door has opened to me and there are many adversaries. If you've been saved any length of time, you know that this is true personally, that you have things that you know God wants you to have or to do, but you experience personal opposition. This is true for individual churches. The devil fights churches and tries to hinder the work of God. And then, of course, this is true in a broader sense. Just in the last few days in California, Emperor Newsom has given his new edict and that is that churches cannot meet. You cannot meet. And if in any way, you can meet outside in the wintertime, that's great. Yeah, that, but you cannot meet, absolutely you cannot sing. You cannot praise. You cannot pray. Several of our uh, uh, churches uh, called in the last couple of days. What, what should we do about that? That is opposite. By the way, protests and riots, no problem. But sing and praise God and hear God's word. Oh, you are putting everybody at risk. That is opposition against the will of God. So, the context of this passage is God has a purpose and that is to defeat the powers of hell. 1 John 3, 8, for this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. This is what he did everywhere Jesus came when he saw the power of hell at work in human lives, people that were sick, people that were demon-possessed, people that were struggling with sin and habits. He set them free, he healed, he delivered. That is what he did on the earth. But if the only work of God was accomplished when Jesus was on the earth, it's simply not enough. So Matthew 16 now is the unveiling of God's purpose in the earth. Jesus is now, and our next sermon we're going to talk about the cross. He's telling them, I'm not going to be here. But the purpose of God, I don't want it to stop. And so God's purpose, as in the scriptures we just read, is the transfer of spiritual authority to every believer. 
This is the principle of delegating authority, or we could say deputizing believers. Yavapai County that we live in here in Prescott has one sheriff, one man. He is in charge of certain uh, 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 areas of the law in an entire county. He obviously, as one man, can only do so much. He can only stop so much crime, investigate so much crime. But if he deputizes others and says, I'm giving you the power that I have or the authority, he multiplies the ability to stop crime. So a deputy then is one who has the same authority that the sheriff has. He gives them or lends them his authority. So now Jesus is about to talk about the cross. The cross was God's means of defeating the devil's authority in the earth. The devil loses his right in the earth in many different ways. Colossians 2.15, God stripped the spiritual rulers and powers of their authority on the cross, he won the victory and showed the world that they were powerless. So Jesus, when he died on the cross, the devil used to have rights because sin gave him legal power on earth. And that scripture that we just read, when Jesus died, he paid to remove the power of hell or his right to, to torment and work in many ways on the earth. And so now because of that, Jesus is giving them a little preview, knowing that he's going to defeat the powers of hell. He says, I am going to give you my power. John 20, 21 and 22, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, now I send you. And after he said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So he says, I'm giving you what I have. You then can use that to affect God's will in the earth. In the last year of my father's life, he gave me power of attorney and he added me to his bank accounts. He didn't do that so that I could buy stuff. It was his money. Whenever a bill came, I could take a check, at the top of the check it said Wayman Mitchell, but I could use that power of attorney. I could write Greg Mitchell and it would be accepted to work the purposes of my father, which was to pay his bills. That is exactly what Jesus says. In ourselves, we don't have power. Through the cross, he has power. He says, I'm going to give you some of my authority so that you can carry out the purposes of God. Let's talk secondly about binding and loosing. Jesus says he gives authority or, or he gives the believers Keys, Verse 19, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Keys in the Bible, they are symbols of authority or one who has rights. My parents' house, I had keys. I had the right to enter the house because I had the key. Here in the church, we have these fancy electronic keys. We don't have metal keys we have these electronic keys and depending on how much authority you have, that will determine how many doors your key can open. Some of you, you can open one door. That's all your key will work. I'm a very powerful guy. My key will open all the doors. I'm feeling very special. As long as I make sure that I charge that key and it doesn't die, then that's another issue. So. Keys. Jesus says, I'm giving you keys. This is speaking, and, and this is not all that is involved here, but primarily he is speaking about prayer. Prayer is inviting the power of God into earth or into human situations where we live. Matthew 6.10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is 
in heaven. Prayer is based on the will of God. Our job is to find out what God has already told us that he wants to happen. And therefore, prayer changes things. When we know what God's will is that he wants to happen, then we look in the area that we live and we identify what is not God's will. We look and identify that in our lives, perhaps that sickness or poverty or barrenness or a, a marriage conflict or many different kinds of issues, that is not God's will. And so then prayer, using the keys of prayer, we then bring the power of God to change what is not God's will into God's will, your will be done. And so there's two dimensions of prayer here. Verse 19, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. There's the first dimension. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So keys bind any of you that you have a security door, or you have locks on your doors, you lock them, you are forbidding entrance to thieves or people who would want to do you harm. That's the power of a lock. Locks bind. They stop certain things. But keys release. When Lisa and I lived in South Africa, that you, South Africa's... Uh, the, uh, the people who aren't criminals are the ones who live behind bars in every house, every window, every door. You had incredible. And, and uh, often we, had, we lived in houses that the doors didn't have a quick release that you would turn. You had to have a key. And so there be, there's times when there'd be a problem. There are people that even the house catch on fire. You had to have a key to be released you can't get out without a key. So here's the two dimensions. You can either stop things from happening or you can allow or cause things to happen. Look at these in detail for a moment. Let's talk about the power of binding. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. This involves negatives. There are certain things that you can look at in your own life or you can look at in the church or you can look at in our nation or the world and you can say it should not be happening. It should not be like that. Then Jesus says, I'm giving you the right to say no. I do not want poverty, sickness, mental torment, whatever it might be. You have the power to, the word is used here, bind. Simply put, in the original language, it means to tie up, to put in chains, forbid, prohibit, declare, to be illegal. Literally, you are saying, no, I don't want it to be like this. Mark 1, 34, Jesus healed many who had different kinds of sicknesses. He forced many demons to leave People and he would not allow the demons to speak. That's, that's a classic. That is a picture here of binding. Here is sickness. No, I don't want them to be sick. There are demons. He makes them, I don't want them to be tormented. And very interesting, he says he would not allow the demons to speak. He would not allow certain things. This is not God's will, and so therefore, that is a picture of binding. Listen, there are people that are hung up on the formula. Do you have to say, I bind you in Jesus' name, or is it in the name of Jesus? The words are not important. Listen, you can bind the powers of hell without ever using the word bind. There are some people that are hung up on this, or, or some, they, you know, charismatics, they get into this, that, that the key is theatrically. you got to say it like this. you got to say, I bind you, devil. And if you're from the South, it's got to be banned. And somehow that makes it more powerful. That, that is not. 
The words, the formula are not important. You can say it many different ways, any different way. It doesn't matter. Basically, if you're binding, you're saying, no, I do not want this to happen. Joshua chapter 11, they capture five enemy kings. They put them in a cave and they sealed up the cave with stones. These are enemies that used to rule and determine what happened in this area, but now they are sealed up. What are they doing? They are binding them. You will not rule here anymore. Then they brought the enemy kings out and they had leaders put their feet on the necks of these men because they're publicly saying, that is actually, we get our Bible word, dominion, to put underfoot. They're saying, you're not going to rule here anymore. No. That is what binding is in whatever words you use. When you know what God's will is, when you recognize there's some area of my life or my world that is not in line with the will of God, I bind that or I don't want that to happen. I say no to that. Acts 16, 18, Paul is grieved when, uh, by a girl. Uh, she has a demon inside of her. And finally, he uh, uh, rebuked and said, come out of her. Paul was saying, no, no more. I'm not going to let you torment her anymore. This is in many different ways. Tom Paine, one point in his life, he said he recognized that poverty ran in his family and in his own life and uh, Poverty was at work. He's struggling constantly in finances. And he said he prayed and said, God, I want this changed. I don't want to live in poverty anymore. And he said something broke off of his life. Something was bound or stopped from being able to work in his life. You've heard me tell through the years, my father, when he first pastored in 1960 in Wickenburg, Arizona, a church that had never paid the salary of the pastor, had never had any money of any kind. And one day he was in the church building alone, recognizing this is not right that God's work doesn't have money. And he said he got inspired and he stood up and he said, devil, get your hands off the finances that God has ordained to be in this church. He said an hour later, there was a knock on the door and a woman said, I was sitting at home and I remembered we sold some property and I've never tithed. And she handed over in 1960, $1,100 in the next hour another woman came and said I remember that I never gave some money that I meant to give and gave another $300 that's not an accident that's not a coincidence my father said no I'm not letting this happen anymore sickness that's another area there are people you recognize there are things that run in your family all the women in my family they all have this anymore or they have this at work but you have the right to say no when our daughter was backslidden I used to pray and I would say devil you're not gonna have her let her go. That is, bind, I'm binding your power in her life. 2 Samuel 15, 31. David was told that Ahithophel is among the conspirators. And so David said, O oh Lord, I pray, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. I'm going to tell you, that prayer right now is what I'm praying in all of the shenanigans of this election. I am praying, saying, God, there are wicked men who are trying to cheat. They're, try they're cooking up plots to steal. God, turn it into foolishness. Let them be exposed. I bind that. I will not let that ruin our nation. Listen to this. A group of construction workers in Charlotte, North Carolina, saw a man trying to break into one of their construction vehicles, and so they caught the man... And with ropes they tied, and then with packing tape, they taped him to the scaffolding until police arrived. 
that, you know what they did? They literally bound him. They said, no, you are not going to steal our stuff. Secondly, there's the power of loosing. Verse 19, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Loosing involves positives. If binding is saying no to certain things, loosing is saying yes, or there will be certain things. The word loose, to set free one who's bound to release a prisoner or to allow to happen. When Lazarus was raised from the dead, there's a great picture of conversion, a miracle from death to life. Jesus gave a command to the disciples, loose him and let him go. He would, would have been wrapped like a money, mummy in grave clothes. Wonderful that he's raised to life, but he said he must be loose. That is what you need to do when people pray for salvation. Thank God. But we know immediately, all of a sudden, they start getting job offers in other places. They start getting uh, uh, people interested in them romantically. They start getting offered free drugs and free alcohol, which never happened their whole life. Jesus says, but you can loose them and let them go, you can literally, God, I'm releasing a new way of thinking in their lives. Peter was in prison, but as people began to pray, he was loosed, he was released or set free. So loosing is when you release the power of God into a situation. I'm not just talking about in general, loosing is not God, I, pray, I release you to move in the earth. No, we're talking about there are certain things that need to happen. There are friends and family that you're witnessing to, they do not feel bad for the way that they're living. So that means you could pray and say, God, I am releasing, I'm allowing conviction to come upon them. Anybody that I love, if they're not saved, I'm not praying that God make them successful and wonderfully happy. I'm praying, God, convict them. Don't let them sleep at night. Make them miserable so that they see their sin as it is. God, give them revelation. New converts need revelation. They have to get it for themselves. People have to have revelation to get saved. God, I release hunger for the things of God. We're, we're talking about open doors of opportunities. Revelations 3.8, I've set before you an open door and no one can shut it. This may be financially. Let jobs be released, industries in our city, promotions on my behalf. That, that souls in prayer, God, I'm, I'm asking you to give us supernatural intersections. Let me meet people whose hearts are open now at the right time and give us opportunities. You know, what's connected with releasing is favor. The Bible says the prison door opened for Joseph. Why? Because Pharaoh gave him favor. He liked him. He promoted him. So we're talking that you can pray, God, I need you to open doors. I need you to cause the natural circumstances to change into favor and help on my behalf. Remember Mark Olson telling a story when they moved here from the Philippines. Many years ago, Michelle Olson had determined that she wanted to live after living in the tropics. She wanted a house, if I remember right, uh, in pine trees and, she had found a house, and this is the one she wanted to rent him. The owner of the house had had a bad experience with uh, someone before, and he said, no, I will not rent you this house. When he heard that they are uh, uh, missionaries, they had just arrived, and he looked at it, that that was a risk, and he said, no, I will not rent it. But Michelle Olson said, I am praying to my heavenly Father, who loves me and wants to provide, I'm praying that my heavenly father will rent me this house. And that man said, well, it's not going to happen. 
but a little while later called up and he said, I don't know why I'm doing this, <laughs> but I'm going to let you rent the house favor. Open doors. God, I release that in our lives. If you've been watching in the news in the last uh, uh, month or so, you've seen U.S. Marshals have been locating mis missing children. U.S. Marshals have located 440 missing children this year. Of all the children missing in America, they made a list of those that they say are critically missing, meaning they're in danger often. They're either in abusive situations or at risk of being trafficked. One of the U.S. Marshals recalled the rescue of one teen girl. There was a man with her. The marshals arrested him. She thought the marshals were there just to arrest the man, but the marshals said, no, we're here for you. That's why we're here. He's incidental. We are here to set you free. And he said the girl was surprised that anyone cared enough to rescue her. Here is the power that God gives. Every minute, the moment you get saved, God says, I am giving you that power to bind or stop what should not be happening, to release or allow what should be happening. Let's look finally at qualifications and promise as we close. There are, of course, some qualifications to binding and loosing. Very quickly, you must be a believer. If you're not saved, it's not going to work. You can say bind all you want. It ain't going to happen. The seven sons of Siva, these were men that they had seen Paul cast out demons and they thought, wouldn't that be cool? So they found a demon-possessed man and they said, in the name of Jesus that uh, Paul preaches about. But it didn't work. Instead, they were attacked and beaten and stripped by the demon-possessed man. You got to be a believer. Number two, the context of this story tells us your authority is connected to the church. The context, the setting, where it is binding and loosing, where do we hear about it? Connected to the church. So listen, if you're not part of a church, that's not God's will. Your spiritual authority is going to be lacking. There are, I don't need to go to church. I just worship the Lord at home. Your authority is going to be lacking. It's the church. It's when you're connected that you have authority. If you're harming the church, there are people who are a part of the church, but they cause problems while they're in the church. Then I tell you, your authority is going to be lacking. And then if you reject spiritual authority in the church, your authority will be lacking. If you're a rebel at heart, don't be surprised when your prayers are lacking. So it's connected to the church. Thirdly, binding and loosing is only used for God's will, not ours. You can't use spiritual authority to manipulate people, right? If you're an ugly brother, you can't be praying, oh God, cause her to marry me. No, that is not what binding and loosing is for. 1 John 5, 14, this is the boldness, the confidence we have in God's presence that if we ask God for anything that agrees with what he wants, then he hears us. And, and think about this. What incredible promises are connected in this verse. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Think about it. whatever. Sickness. There needs to be health. Is, is your need salvation? You have someone you love that is not saved. Is your need fruitfulness? Is it a job? Is the issue in your life you need work? Is the problem you're facing debt? You need finances to uh, 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 affect and meet your needs? 
Is it in your business? Is your problem in your marriage? Is it with your children? Is it housing vehicles? Is it ministry, the gifts of the Spirit? Whatever. He doesn't limit it. If it is in line with the will of God, he says you can pray for anything. You can apply this principle in every area. You know what the difficulty is? When we are binding and it doesn't seem like anything is bound. When we're loosing and it doesn't seem like anything is loosed. So what then? Do you give up on prayer? So we've had to some dear saints of God that have passed away this year, and yet the Bible says God wants to heal. So what do we do? Stop praying for healing? No, absolutely not. Our call is to pray with faith. Listen, in, in your life, maybe you've had some setbacks in fruitfulness. Maybe in your life there have been struggles in marriage or with your children or on the job. Our call is to believe God and pray. Use the power and authority that he's given to every believer. God, there are areas of my life this must change. God, we're praying right now in our nation. Oh, God, you must get involved. Something has to change. And we believe that God gets involved. I close with this. Pastor Scott Bauer once uh, before he was a pastor, he said he was given an experiment in science class. The professor gave each of them two beakers of clear liquid. They had no color. And he said, if you mix these two clear liquids, it will change color. It will turn pink. And he said, I want you to do an experiment. I want you to put in from one beaker to the other, one drop at a time, and I want you to count how many drops does it take before things change. And he said it was tedious. You're putting it in with an eyedropper. One, nothing. Two, over and oh, and they're marking each one. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And then he said, he put in another drop, and for a second, it turned pink, but then went clear again. It's like, ah. Oh. He said that happened several more times, a flash of color, but then it would go back to, but then one more drop, and all of a sudden, it completely changed. What used to be clear was now Pink. So here's the question, which drop was the most important in bringing the change? And the answer is all of them. That's what prayer is like, that we begin to apply. I, I remember as a new convert asking Pastor Mitchell, when we bind the devil, how much is he bound? I wanted percentages. I want to know, like, yeah. <laughs> We pray. You can look at your family wait, waiting for tears in their eye. You, listen, but believe in God. God is able to change things. He's able to turn things around. I want you to bow your heads. Close your eyes all across this place. If you would, just for a moment, thank God. In a moment, we're going to pray we're going to ask God to help some people in practical areas. But before we do that, remember, I told you one of the qualifications. If you want God's power in your life, you must be a Christian. You must be born again. God does not bless sin. He does not bless self-will. The Bible says all of us, we are born sinners. We are rebels at heart. We choose to break God's commands and go against his will. I don't care what form. For some of you, that's drugs or alcohol, pornography. Others, it's sleeping with people you're not married to. Others, it's racial prejudice, bitterness, hatred. I don't care what form it is. It's all rebellion. You're breaking God's commands. And it cuts you off from the power of God. God who wants to help, he wants to heal. 
and transform. And listen, I'm telling you that there is an answer. Jesus said, I'm going to die on the cross. And that is how the will of God can come to your life. If you're here tonight and you are not born again, if you know that, say, I'm not right with God. God would not be pleased with the way that I'm living. I want to give you an opportunity before we do anything else. If you want to pray and surrender to God, I want you to do this. Lift your hand up so I can see it. By lifting your hand, you're saying, I'm not saved. I know that. I want to get right with God. How many would there be all across this place? Lift your hand up. I need Jesus. Some of you are backslidden. You were saved in the past. Backslider, lift up your hand. I want to get right with God. How many would there be? You'd come home and surrender to God. Let God begin to heal you where you're broken and you're hurting. Thank God. All across this place. Thank God that I'm, I'm giving a challenge. Amen. You lifted your hand. I want you to come. I want you to pray. So I'm praying with I'm giving a challenge to those that are online. Maybe you watch tonight, wherever you're watching it, and you're not right with God. You can surrender because salvation is a heart issue. If you want to surrender to God, I want to help you to pray. I want you to say this out loud. Say, God in heaven, I believe in Jesus Christ that he died on the cross for my sin. I ask you to forgive me. Come into my heart. Give me the power to live for you from this day on in Jesus' name. Amen. God, those that prayed online, I need you. Seal those words. God, I'm asking you to cause them to respond and let them do the will of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank God. I want you all to stand up to your feet. I'm going to open the altars. Some of you, God gave you a challenge. You have areas of your life. You recognize this is not the will of God. Then change it. Use the power of God. I'm going to apply that. Binding and loosing. I want God's will in my life. The altars are open. I'm inviting you to come. Find a place to pray. They're going to sing while people are praying.